This is the Wrench in the Machine, an association of Ishtar story by Bonsert Bokel and edited by Dean Wilkins, with music by Marco Ilianello of Musical Wizardry. Chapter 1 Good morning, Dover. I'm Frank Dimbleby of the Dover Public Broadcast. This news bulletin is provided by the Kent News Network of the 7th of May, 1875. It's one minute past eight. Some of today's highlights. The discussion on the expansion of Kent's rescue services. The controversy around the proposed Home Army Bill that is about to enter Parliament. Finally, a debate on the question, is our entertainment being weaponized? This discussion was sparked after a reviewer of the London Journal accused a London playwright latest stage play of being signalite propaganda. But first, more protests at the Autocrab main office after the company announced the expansion of its space program. The protesters claim the weaponization of the rockets is inevitable. They display drawings of Napoleon I throwing R2 rockets at England with the phrase Never forget. More demonstrations have been announced, including one near Pendleton War Park Memorial in Dover. Excuse me, our producer just came in with a special bulletin. This is just in. The Dover Borough Police announced the Dover Priory Railroad Station has been locked down. This is due to a crime committed on the premises last night. They advise the public to use other means of transportation for the remainder of the day. They apologize for the inconvenience. On with the program. The rhythm of galloping hooves slowed down as the coach pulled in in front of the Dover Priory Railroad Station. As soon as the carriage came to a standstill, the door swung open, and Inspector David Alborough stuck his head out of the tobacco-smelling coupé and coughed. As he got out, he breathed the spring air in through his nose and sighed. It was a breezy morning after a night of light rain, and the aromatic smell of wet fauna drifted in the air. But the moment Alborough began to move, he felt clammy, and the sunlight revealed the unkempt state of his brown tweed waistcoat. Inspector Bixby followed him outside, ready to produce another cigarette, despite finishing the last one just moments ago. Alborough did not mind his younger colleague's smoking habit that much. It was the stale smell of smoke that bothered him. As Alborough brushed the fluff of his vest, a young, well, to the inspector's standards anyway, dressed in a blue, leaning police coat approached him in a huff. Alborough addressed him first. As was his custom. Morning, Dobby. What do you have for us today? The young officer saluted and gave his report. Morning, sass. It's a weird one. Two seps dead, both night watchmen. They're cut up bad by the maniac. But that's not the weird thing, he added ominously. A double homicide is not good enough, asked Bixby. You better see it for yourself, sirs. Derby said, nodding his head slightly, and walked away like a young boy who was about to show something off. The inspectors found his behavior odd, but shrugged their shoulders and went along with the constable. The young officer wasn't kidding about the railway men. Their lifeless bodies were found beside a train that was scheduled to be unloaded that very morning. Both victims were elderly guards, merely present to be a deterrent against criminals at night. Now they lay there, in the same position as the moment they were slain. Quite efficiently so, or so Alborough fought. Derby explained the situation. Barry Wilts and Jonathan Slober, aged 75 and 86, worked for the LCDR for several years now, started working the night shift a few years back. Meanwhile, Alborough looked at all the signs. The men were killed where they stood. Wilts had been stepped through the throat with such force his back was pressed against the sides of the railway carriage and left a trail of blood on the rough boards as he collapsed. Mr. Slober had dropped to the ground in fright. Alborough imagined a poor man looking up at his murderer as he tried to shield himself with his arm, which consequently got severed at the elbow. The limb got slashed with such force it lay six feet away from the body on the terminal floor. 
Then Slovo was stabbed several times in the throat and chest, as if he was a pin cushion. Alboro bent his knee, and inspected the severed arm on the terminal floor, still clutching a handle of an electric lantern. The cut seemed clean, surgical even. No axe could have done so without rending the flesh. There was just too much force to be applied for a knife. A saber, perhaps? The inspector still found this unlikely. Squatted, Bixby carefully observed his quarry, Mr. Wills. One straight horizontal step through the artery and went straight out the back of the neck, right into the panel behind him, Bixby remarked as he rose to his feet. Then he pointed out a deep cut mark in the sideboard near the top of the blood trail. The murderer severed the spine, looks like. Nerd rules out an axe, groaned Allborough, and raised himself. Bixby, look at the distance between these bodies. His colleague took position between the corpses and spread his arms wide. Both in arm's reach. Seems a bit neat for an ordinary criminal, he concluded. I suppose the victims found a trespasser, approached them, and once in reach they were attacked. Indeed, said Alborough, looking at the severed arm. They were too close together to be stabbed by a saber like that, and the murderer couldn't have looked that threatening if they approached him voluntarily. He carried a concealed weapon then, Bixby thought out loud. How about a butcher's knife? Alboro considered it, but shook his head. The puncture wounds look too narrow. Maybe the cornerer can come up with something. Alboro turned to the young officer. Constable Derby, anything taken? Like wallets or badges? No, sir, nothing's missing, the lad answered. Not even from the cargo inside the wagon, we think. Alboro looked at the open carriage door beside the body leaning against the carriage. Is that what you wanted to show us? The constable nodded, gesturing them to follow him. What they discovered inside the cargo hold was indeed something to behold. Cold fumes arose from within the crate as the inspector stared at the body curled up inside. Above it, scratched crudely inside the interior of the lid, was a number 54. Bixby stroked his fingers through his hair. This is indeed something you don't see every day. Indeed, murmured Alborough, distracted by the number scratched inside a broken lid. The fact it was just a number was ominous enough, but for some reason it had a stripe struck through it, like a notch on a gun handle. The many scratches that comprised the numbers had been carved vindictively into the resin, which was in stark contrast to the neat executions outside. What do you think it means? Arboro asked, scratching the burn scar on his right jaw. Calling card, guessed Bixby. Like a villain from one of those wave serials, remarked Arboro. I swear, those things are a bad influence, he complained, and looked inside the crate. What about this fine gentleman? The frosting eyes was dripping down the body's eyebrow as they observed a middle-aged man lying in the shallow bath of icy water. Alboro concluded that the man was probably a working-class stiff, no pun intended. The inspector based his assumption on the ward and old-fashioned clothes the victim was wearing, not that dissimilar of his own. A broad, purplish line around his throat betrayed he was hanged before being stuffed in there. The inspector laid his hand on the smooth, yellowish sides of the crate's interior and scanned the surface of his fingers. The lid, which was laid discarded on the ground, had a similar inlay. It felt similar to ember resin, but more flexible and without the discoloration. What are the sides made of? A uh, plastic, I suspect, responded Bixby. Utter crap claims plastic will replace ember resin and most metal alloys in the next twenty years. Bixby was always on top of new developments. Maybe it was just his generation, hooked on wavecasters and eager to hear what could await them in the future. Alboro knocked on the plastic with the knuckles of his index fingers. It produced a hollow sound. It's probably a vacuum in there, Bixby continued. It's how the contents remained frozen until the murderer broke the lid. Meanwhile, Aubro was looking at two crates in similar size that had been broken open. These contained boxes and random trinkets, but no obvious damage from implements like a crowbar was to be seen. Alboro turned to Bixby. How long do you think the body had been in there? Based on the French labels in the box, I say less than two weeks. I can hardly tell if rigor mortis had time to set in due to the ice. Orbro moved the victim's trouser leg up and lay bare a purplish-blue skin. Does this look broken to you? Trauma to the lower leg. Mostly heavily bruising and abrasions due to being tied up. 
There are similar injuries on the wrist. The ankle seemed to have been contracted oddly. Might be due to trauma. So, he was either in a fight or tortured. Then he was hung by the neck. Alboro put his hand in his side. Why bother breaking into a carriage if they're murdering two men just to open this crate? Maybe they wanted us to find the body, Bixby suggested. You know, get us on the trail of those who put him in there. The other inspector finished his spots. And then we take care of their competition. Other than that, Bixby pondered out loud, if the body itself was so valuable, why leave it? Maybe he was expecting something else, suggested Alborough. The constable stepped forward with hesitation in the step. According to the station master, this crate was supposed to be picked up from the depot this morning, he said softly. By whom? Howard and Chambers Logistics, sir, announced Constable Derby. To the young man's delight, the old inspector nodded approvingly. Good work, constable. I never heard of them, mumbled Bixby. Neither have I. That will be your first step, then. Constable, take care of the Frenchman. Bixby stepped closer. If he's indeed a foreign, this needs to be reported to Scotland Yard. Indeed, and I don't want to be bothered with the paperwork. That is why we'll find out where this Howard and Chambers lot hangs out. Derby wanted to protest. But sirs, if you don't... Look at this as valuable work experience, Constable. All borough it. Also, you will get to show your face at the Chief Inspector's office when he needs you to sign the final forms. I suppose. Good man. Give me the address and we're good to go. Come, Bixby. On the way to the old industrial district, the inspector's carriage drove past the working class apartments of Dover. Alborough was in luck. This was a no smoking cabin. The interior didn't even have that stale tobacco smell like most carriages. Bixby, however, was already fidgeting with his feet. Are you sure you wouldn't rather be signing forms? asked Bixby. This might be a foreign affairs thing. Alboro pouted his lips. Probably. But if we have smugglers in our town, they are our responsibility. True enough. Funny, last night there was an episode of The Shade on the caster called Cold Case. I'm sure there was, responded Alboro half-heartedly. Even when Bixby started to summarize the plot, the old inspector was distracted by a blimp passing over the city, parading Uta Crab stack line, Bringing tomorrow's future today. Do you even have a wastecaster, David? asked Bixby. No, Alboro responded absentmindedly. I was born before that time, and I always managed to keep myself occupied with dolls, sir. Hell no, I was an animal man, Alboro announced proudly. I preferred the wilds and the sensation of the wind on my face as I rode around on my hobby horse with a pen on my head and like the knights of old. All of a sudden, he felt an unexpected sense of melancholy. But one day, I realized I had no idea where I left that hobby horse. My father made it for me, and I just forgot about it. When I recalled the horse, I just... The inspector changed the subject. Do parents still make toys for their children, Tom? My grandfather did, Bixby answered, after his retirement. I mean, these days we can't make stuff as cheaply as the companies can. Things are changing. Alboro looked at the blimp again. You don't say. That cool box, Bixby began pedantically. Imagine that cool box. If we can save bodies that way, we can preserve food. Did you just use the word food and body in one sentence, Bixby? B well, he muttered, caught of God. You know what I mean. The coach slowed down as the driver announced. This is as close as I can get, gentlemen. This place is a mess. Abandoned crates and junk go everywhere from here on out. How come? Bixby asked as they got out. Lots of abandoned warehouses and closed down companies. They just left their wares on the street. Another score for progress, I assume, mumbled Alboro. You know anything about Howland and Chambers by any chance? The driver seemed surprised by the question. Just by the name, sir. But I've never seen them around, if you catch my drift. Alboro nodded. The statement confirmed his suspicion that HNC was probably just a front, because Dover was the gate to England. There was no shortage of such companies. The government, on the grounds of liberal principle, didn't allow the police to perform invasive investigation into private property. Not until somebody complained anyway, so these fronts could flourish. 
As the inspectors entered the district, they realized the driver wasn't kidding either. The alleys, originally intended for freight transport, were cluttered with abandoned wares and rusting devices. Some warehouses were converted to workshops occupied by craftsmen who obviously didn't require all that space. But the building owners would take on any tenants at this point. Finally, they found it, an unremarkable warehouse with a large sign in front displaying Howard and Chambers Logistics. It had an entrance gate for a single wagon and a normal door beside it. The paint had started to flake off the wetted brickwork, but other than that, the building didn't seem in too bad a condition. Alboro knocked politely on the plain door and waited. There was no response. Alboro knocked again. This is working hours, Bixby complained. They should be in. This time, Alboro slammed his fist on the door. Anyone there? This is the police. We have questions for you. Allow me, Bixby said when no reply came. With a loud thump, the inspector knocked down the door and broke it off his hinges. Oh, bloody hell, he cried, kneeling forward. Be careful, inspector. Alboro grinned at his colleague's expense. I'm not the only one growing older. Alboro's smile disappeared when he heard a child giggle in the distance. Just help me up, will you? I hurt my knee. Bixby cringed. Oh, right. Alboro responded, distracted, and aided his colleague. You heard that? Heard what? He listened for a moment. Never mind, said Alboro, while looking around the hangar. Everything seemed to be in order. Stables, a shaft, a pulley system for loading and unloading, a staircase to the attic. It didn't appear in disuse. But there was no obvious cargo either. Looks empty to me, Bixby stated while brushing himself off. I can see that. It's probably a front. Just to move somebody seems a tad extreme. A loud thump shook the man up who looked up at the ceiling. It sounded like a box hitting the floorboards. Jins raised, the inspector stared upward. Mixby pulled out his surface pistol with his eyes focused on the attic. Who's there? Put that away, man, warned Alboro. Intensely, he observed the planks overhead. Then, from the corner of his eye, he saw a shadow move between the cracks. He glanced at Bixby, who nodded to confirm that he saw it too, and then they moved slowly to the staircase. Come on, we know you're there, said Alboro sternly. Show yourself, we are with the police. Without sudden movements, the inspectors walked up the steps. Carefully, they rose their heads above the floorboards and scanned the attic for any movement behind the sacks, crates and barrels. We just want you to answer a few questions reiterated Alboro, but there was no response. The layout of the floor was simple. At the front end, there was an enclosed office area. At the other, nothing but a broken ceiling window just above some stacked-up barrels. Too small for adults, but just big enough for a child. Alboro gestured to his colleague to head for the office, and he moved in the opposite direction. This is your last chance. If you keep resisting, we'll have no choice but to... He raised his voice dramatically. Bring you in. Another loud bang made the inspector jump off his feet as the weight of the fallen object reverberated through the floorboards. Startled, Alboro turned around to see Bixby staring at a fallen crate in front of him. Bixby? He looked at him in denial. I swear, I did... Sir, behind you! The inspector turned around to spot the shape of a child climbing the pile of barrels toward the broken window. Stop! he cried and gave chase. But the youngster already made its way to the roof. Stop you! Alboro yelled again as he climbed the bottom barrel. I just want to... Ah! He lowered his leg as his thigh cramped up. There it was again. That childish laughter. He looked at the window where a small girl giggled at his expense, her hair reflecting bright orange sunlight. You little... He stopped as he noticed a weird reflection in the light of her left eye, like that of a cat. Then she dashed away. Are you all right? asked Bixby as he came over. I'm fine, he shouted, holding a spy. Go after... I can't fit through that hole, man! 
The dismayed officers fell silent as they looked around idly. What the hell happened? complained Alboro. I swear, that crate moved by itself, Bixby responded defensively. Alboro looked away in disbelief. I wasn't even close, he reiterated and relaxed with a sigh. How's your leg? I'm fine, the old inspector grumbled as he staggered toward the office. The door of the room was unlocked, and the officers moved in to inspect the place. It was obvious someone had been staying here. There was a makeshift bed, drawings on the desk of young people with freakishly large eyes, candy wrappers smelling of raspberry toffee lay scattered on the ground. Beside the pillow on the bed, there was an old rag doll. It looked a bit impish, with a large, oblong head, egg-shaped eyes, and a white-stitched smile. Its fantastical robe, shell-shaped hat, and red mop of hair made him suspect it was supposed to be a witch. Whatever it was supposed to be, he had never seen any toy like it. Now what? Bixby asked. Alvaro spotted a note on the desk and picked it up. The moment he glanced at its contents, he squinted his eyes in dismay. The writing seemed to be an odd mixture of Arabic and Gothic letter styles. Any attempts to mumble out the phrases ended up in nothing but nonsensical gibberish. But there was a sentence he did make out, written in forced English handwriting. Castle Hill Road. 44, Alboro whispered to himself. He knew it wasn't that far from Priory Station. Found anything, David? yelled Bixby from the other room. Nothing, he answered. We'll tell them we found an empty warehouse. Bixby walked in, dusting off his bowler hat. And the child? You wanna go look for an urchin in Dover, be my guest. Yeah. I have enough to do. You have been listening to the first chapter of The Wrench in the Machine, an association of Ishtar story by Bonsert Bokel. We hope you enjoyed this presentation. The Wrench in the Machine and its prequel comic, S36, The Call Girl, is available on your usual online store such as Amazon. The Association of Ishtar is a collection of science fiction, steampunk and Lovecraftian stories set in the multiverse of the Association of Ishtar, which are freely available online for everyone to read. Thank you for listening.